Okay, I think we have a very exciting session before lunch, and I'm sure that's going to keep you wide awake. Um, so, uh, as you may have noticed, there's been a slight change in the program, which isn't reflected in the published versions. So I'll be the chair for today for this session, uh, and I'll, uh, just as a quick background, uh, I've worked with the African National Congress for a long time. Um, and I've worked in government as a spokesperson for a long time, and I was a diplomat in the Middle East region. And um, so people refer, me, refer to me as an ex-terrorist, an ex-government spin doctor, and now I work for the banking sector. So they said it's all in line with all the other professions I've had. Um, but my in <laughs> Yes, yeah. <laughs> In the crosshair of financial health. so I'm the head of strategy at the Banking Association of South Africa, but I do have an abiding um, interest in the Middle East region, uh, both academically and having served as South Africa's ambassador to Oman for five years and then Abu Dhabi for five years. So, as I said, this is going to be a really interesting uh, session, um, and it's, uh, I'm glad it's been included as part of the program because... It's often, you know, when we speak of civil society and NGOs, you know, we go all uh, weak need and starry eye. Think, oh well, all good can emanate from that. And I think today's session is going to be bursting some uh, bubbles around that. That we've seen just as social media can be abused, and even uh, the, this morning session is looking at how different uh, regimes and administrations can involve themselves in um, uh, social media. We also have civil society uh, or NGOs in civil society uh, pushing uh, very particular agendas as well. Uh, one good example of that in South Africa is the, a trade union called Solidarity. And I mean, it's such a wonderful name. You know, people think of all kinds of nice things when they hear of Solidarity. And yet, it pushes quite a strong um, uh, right-wing, almost white kind of agenda. Um, so. It's useful to, when looking at, at the negative side of civil society in the MENA region, uh, it's, to, it's useful to look at what interests are being represented, um, but also at the same time, when looking at that question, not to become so parochial that uh, we don't think that uh, different uh, uh, NGOs cannot be advancing particular interests, because that's what we've been experiencing in the past. So, to kick us off, uh, and you've got the um, uh, bios and uh, short uh, summaries of the speeches, I'll ask Ph Phyllis Benes to start us off, and then that'll be followed by Tariq Dana, and then Fatima Shabadin will follow thereafter. Thank you. Over to you, Phyllis. Good morning, everyone. Thank you all. A particular thanks to AMAC, to Mahalatsi and Nasli, and the rest of the team. And you too, Naeem, on, on occasion. Uh, let me just say one thing before I begin, and that is um, I am a US citizen, and I'm really, really sorry. <laughs> so let me just start with that. Um, I want to talk today about, in a certain way, the transformation of civil society from a variety of different kinds of non-state actors into a preeminence of armed actors who are on the international scale, getting all the attention uh, in, in the region and in other places as well, we're not hearing as much in terms of what we began to discuss yesterday about how broad is this definition of civil society, what does it really mean? Do we talk, for example, about mercenaries who are not state actors, uh, are not paid by the state, maybe are paid by DynCorp, are paid by Blackwater? Uh, are Blackwater and DynCorp themselves part of civil society, are transnational corporations part of civil society. This represents a, a huge uh, debate, but I think we do have to keep in mind the breadth of what we're talking about when we talk about civil society and non-state actors in general. I think something Naeem said yesterday was quite important, which is the issue of nuance. And I think particularly in this era, in the, in the post-Cold War era, when we look around the world, things are much more complicated than it used to be. It used to be in the era of liberation movements, whether it was in the period of decolonization or the period of socialist transformations, that it was the same organizations who were carrying out social programs that we agreed with, 
didn't necessarily agree with every single tactic, but we agreed with the trajectory, the social program of the movement, and they were the same ones carrying out the armed resistance to imperialist intervention of some sort. These days, that's not the case. And I think we were, in many ways, as a broad global movement, we were faced with that for the first time on a massive scale in the Iraq War, when for the first time the issue was not just how to get US troops out of Iraq, how to end that war, but there wasn't anyone among the armed actors on the other side who we necessarily wanted to support, because what they stood for was not anything very progressive, was not for human rights, was not for equality. So it was a, a, a huge contradiction that we had not faced before, and we struggled with it, and I'm not sure we came out of it very well, but at least we've begun taking it up. Today, when we look at non-state actors and civil society, it's all in the context of what has become known gruesomely as the Global War on Terror, or the GWAT, one of my favorite acronyms. Something that, that Derek Gregory called a matrix within which social life becomes part of an all-encompassing battlefield. I thought that was a very powerful image, an all-encompassing battlefield. And even as US interventions and the, the expansion of the US empire has been curtailed to a small degree, it is still acting in a very aggressive manner around the world uh, and intervening militarily. And in that context, trying to capture civil society and non-state actors. When we talk about state capture, we also have to talk about the capture of non-state actors by malevolent forces. In the US, we hear far less discussion these days about democratization as a justification for armed interventions. We hear more directly about this is part of the war on terror. This is counterterrorism that we are engaged with. And that includes now whole civilian communities who are now considered enemy civilians. It's a term that the Israelis use much more frequently than any other government, but the US has taken it on to some degree. And in that context, whole communities, including hospitals, including places of worship, including schools, are all considered fair game. When there are hostages taken, human shields, they are fair game. It's not their fault, but hey, that's the way it goes. Collateral damage, the, the fog of war. We hear all kinds of excuses for it, but what it means is there are no battle lines. Everything becomes a legitimate target. And it's in that context that we see the militarization of so much of civil society and non-state actors. And that means the, the militarization of humanitarian uh, organizations, the military militarization of human rights and reformist movements all across the way. And it, it's a morphing process in, in many cases. Sometimes you have armed actors, armed organizations that emerge in that context. Other times you have unarmed, nonviolent mobilizations which morph into armed actors by a variety of circumstances. And those political mobilizers, the human rights activists, those calling for reform, calling for democracy, they still exist. In many cases, in, in Syria in particular, they have been massively wiped out. Many have been killed. Many have been imprisoned. Many have been driven into exile. A shell of what they once were still exist, but they are not the ones doing the fighting. Those heroic activists, in my view, who fought at the very beginning of the Syrian uprising for uh, for, for democratization against a very brutal regime are not the ones that are fighting today. So we have to be clear about where those distinctions uh, take place, particularly as so much of that fighting becomes internationalized. In that process of co-optation, we see how the rhetoric and the practice of Israel and the United States has given permission now to countries throughout the region and indeed throughout the world to use that kind of action, that kind of rhetoric, and that kind of practice to target entire communities in the name of fighting against terrorism. Now, there has always been resistance across the, the Middle East, North Africa region. There's always been resistance against repressive governments, against poverty, against the lack of democracy, against all those things. And it has taken different forms. That the, the impetus for those problems has often been 
U.S. intervention, U.S. imperialism in the past. That's not something new and different. And resistance is not something new and different. The goals of the United States are not new and different. I do think it's important that we not equate U.S. imperialist goals with capacity to act. And with the assumption that because whether it was Wesley Clark telling us about the seven countries that were going to be invaded within five years, doesn't mean that there was a strategy to do that that was followed by the Pentagon at that time or years later. That was a sector of the militarization of US power. But I think we have to be very careful not to assume that those goals equal the capacity to do it, number one, and we have to be very, very careful not to ignore agency. The fact that the US may have an interest in overthrowing a government doesn't mean that people who first call for the overthrow of their own government are acting as agents of US imperialism. At the same time, we have to be very clear about what is and is not a resistance force. So if we look at Syria, where the government has for many years claimed to be an arm of global resistance and regional resistance to Israeli actions and to US imperialism, we have to be very clear that almost nothing is ever just one thing. So the same governments, as in the case of Syria, will sometimes resist imperialism and at other times will collaborate with imperialism. So we saw same governments that will actually fight against imperialism globally will terribly repress their people at home. Both things are true. Civil society actors can start as heroic fighters for justice and morph into agents of very less heroic factors. When we look at Syria, both Assad regimes to some degree supported Palestinians. Palestinian refugees that were inside Syria. But at the same time, those regimes were responsible for the massacre at Tel Azatar in 1976. They, the, both regimes have opposed Israel, but at the same time kept the Golan Heights quiet, kept the border quiescent, prevented any uprisings. The same governments that opposed US imperialism in the region and globally led the Arab wing of the US coalition where sending warplanes to bomb Syria in 1991. The same regime that stood silent when the, the global war on terror was launched in 2003 very quickly agreed to, to accept US detainees when they were outsourced to Syria for torture and interrogation. Both things are true. The same is true on the other side. Are the White Helmets heroic first responders who are rescuing children out of burning buildings? Or are they imperialist propagandists? The answer is yes. They are both. They are both of those things, and we have to recognize the dualities of these identities, which makes everything very, very complicated. The resistance continues in all of its various messy forms because the problems in the region have not gone away. The problems of dictatorship, the problems of corruption, the problems of poverty, the problems of inequality, the problems of Israeli apartheid, the problems of the drone wars, the global war on terror, the wars in, in Yemen and Libya and the aftermath of all of these wars, none of that is any better. None of that is getting any better. And those structural weaknesses are not static. They change and in many cases they get better way before they get, uh, they get worse be way before they get better. And facing those problems, you have a growing population, a very young population, that is facing unemployment, huge violations of human rights, facing crime, climate crises in almost every country, the lack of democracy. And in that context, resistance, as has been true in history, takes a variety of forms. And in many ways, the current focus on Islamist and Islamic flavored resistance grows, in my view, out of two sets of reasons. The first has to do with earlier failures. So there was a failure of Arab socialism, a failure of Arab nationalism, a failure of pan-Arabism, in many ways a failure of Arab neoliberalism. All of them failed to answer the problems of a young, growing population throughout the region. And in that context, people turn to 
religion. They turn to religion out of desperation in, in every society around the world. When the, the world is collapsing around you, the instinct is for people to turn to smaller identities, to turn away from their larger identities as part of national and international populations, and instead turn to family, religion, sect, tribe, the small identities that are, are somehow more controllable in those moments of desperation. The other side has to do with wars, and the wars that have been waged, that have destroyed communities. In many cases, only organizing through the mosque was, was the only possibility of resistance to war and to repression. And in all of those situations, we, we now have a scenario where in most of the region, most of the resistance is shaped by various versions of, of Islamic influence or Islamist uh, organizations. So in that regional complex of factors, you have a dwindling ability of outside forces to grab and hold and, and be efficient with creating proxies. What you have, if you look at the Arab Spring, for instance, you have the first part of the, of the resistance that was shaped by mainly secular forces demanding various versions of democratization, human rights, ultimately the rights of citizenship, which was a new phenomenon in many countries. I think Egypt was perhaps the best example. And I, I would disagree a little bit with what we talked about yesterday around this notion that the, the Tahrir Square revolution was not really a revolution because it did not change structural realities in Egypt, it just changed who was at the top. I'm not sure I agree with that because while it did not change the political and economic system, it changed something fundamental about civil society in Egypt, which was to make real this claim of the rights of citizens, which had never been a common thread among Egyptian society. There was never that sense that people in Egypt had that right. And suddenly, that's what gave them that right. It created all kinds of problems, we should say, not least the second mobilization in support of what became a military coup, because there was this illusion that, well, we did it once, we can do it again, we are empowered, we can do it all. But that reflected this new understanding that citizenship rights is something that people could claim as their own. And so when you see this, this situation now where those progressive demands for reform that morph into progressive and not so progressive demands for regime change and then are taken over by those from outside, particularly the US and its regional allies, the Saudis, the UAE, Turkey, etc., who want regime change throughout the region for their own quite nefarious purposes, we have a serious problem. So when we look at what the US has done, the US has always, in looking at these countries that had governments that despite their ambiguities, like Syria and others, the US has always supported anti-regime elements. But those were not the elements that began the Arab Spring mobilizations in any of these countries. That is what we have to acknowledge, that these were indigenous, progressive mobilizations of people from both traditional labor movements and others and the newer um, cell phone using, uh, all of the, the, the mobilizations of youth that we've seen across the region came together in these ways that did not take into account those forces that the US had been paying and supporting for many years, hoping that they would somehow rise up against their, their own regimes. And in that context, as these movements morphed into armed movements, one of the consequences of that, of course, is that you lose the mass character of any mobilization. We saw that in Palestine much earlier. The difference between the first and second intifada, the first intifada overwhelmingly nonviolent, the second intifada with a very violent component to it, lost a great deal of its mass character. It didn't have the society-wide mobilization potential of the first intifada, because when there's that level of violence, mass mobilization is not a viable option. It's not a way of involving children, old people, 
women in many cases. So it's a, a very complicated, a very complicated reality. And at the same time, it's understandable why people faced with the massive level of armed repression from those governments chose to ask for international intervention. So people in Libya, many who said, we can do it ourselves. There was a famous banner that was posted, US, don't come. We can do it on our own. But there were Libyan activists who were asking for US intervention. The same was true in Syria. The same is true in Syria today. The white helmets among them. They're not the only ones. But the fact that desperate people ask for US military intervention, ask for outside regime change, ask for whatever they may call it, a no-fly zone, that was what they were supposed to get in Libya, right? Only protection of civilians and a no-fly zone. Yeah, right. Like we didn't know that was going to become immediately, immediately, a regime change operation, which is exactly what happened. It's understandable that people will ask for that because people are desperate and people who are desperate will do desperate things. As international civil society, we have to be very careful not to say that because some people who are desperate are asking for that kind of help, that that necessarily is something we should support. Because we also know what the consequences are. We look at Libya today, how much worse it is for Libyans today than it was before 2011. So I think that's one of the contradictions that we face as international civil society in looking at the decisions of civil society in the region. In finishing up here, since it always goes faster than you think it will, um, I think that we have to be, again, nuanced, not trying to look for heroes and villains and have everyone wearing one identity. There are multiple identities on every side here. When people in more in Europe than in the United States, but people outside of the region looked in many cases to Rojova, the, the Kurdish area of, of Syria, where a Kurdish organization allied with the PKK built what looked like a very progressive uh, new society, very feminist, socialist, and then suddenly they're the US proxies in the war, and suddenly everything changes. This is the reality of war. And it's not ours necessarily to either judge or try and make heroes out of everybody that we see. What doesn't change are those broad goals of imperialism, the profit motives, who profits from these wars. And when we hear, no one wants war, that's so way wrong. There are plenty of people who want war because they are making a killing from these wars. We were just hearing the CNN International special today on the, the uh, US corporations produced the bombs that killed the latest busload of children in Yemen. So this is very important. We see with earlier times, it was easier. It was easier to know, we didn't just say, US stop supporting apartheid, we said we support the ANC and the PAC. We didn't in Central America say just US get out of, get out of Central America, get your troops out. We said we support the FMLN and we support the Sandinistas. In Vietnam, we didn't just say, get out of Vietnam. We said, we support the other side. We want the Vietnamese to win. That's not the case anymore. Those are not the kind of wars that we see being waged right now. So I think that we have to redefine how international civil society sees our relationship to civil society and social movements across the region. And I would just end with a a note that there's a, a terrific film that has opened in most of the world, hasn't officially opened in the US yet, called We Are Many, that began as a film about the mobilization against the war in Iraq from February of 2003. And later, as the film was being made, when the Arab Spring broke, it shifted. So it now looks at the process of movements and how they grow, and how, what they accomplish beyond their immediate goal. And in this case, they looked at the Egyptian organizers of the February 15th protest against war in Iraq, many of whom became some of the key organizers of the Arab Spring. And they talked about how one inspired the next. So we in civil society, I think, have to be very careful not to give up on civil society, on social movements, despite all of these challenges as they get captured 
and the effort is made to capture them by armed groups and by the ultimate armed group, which is the United States government. Thank you. Thank you, Phyllis. And almost to the second, 20 minutes. Thank you very much. Um, I, th I think you've left us with some really important points and questions. I think the one really big issue is you know, the, that you know, the Arab Spring didn't just spring out of nowhere, that there was a whole set of processes and resistances before that, and that there's a whole lot of elements that have continued beyond the, those heady years of 2011, 2012. So that will be an important thing that we can look at going forward. Um, I still remember Rami Khoury saying that there's a bit of Orientalism by referring to it as Arab Spring, as if it just came out of nowhere. So let's pick that up. I think also let's pick up the, the challenge that you're raising around how international civil society looks at these various manifestations and the kind of mobilization that people that are outside of those various zones uh, engage in. Going on to uh, Tariq Dana, who will be speaking on undermining national agendas through NGOization, the case of Palestine. Tariq. Thank you very much. Special thanks to our friends at AMIC for the invitation. I'm really glad to be here and to focus on the negative side of Palestinian civil society as reflected on the NGOization of Palestinian civil society and to have the chance for some informal discussions with uh, friends in South Africa to learn if they face similar uh, methods of co-optation uh, during the anti-apartheid uh, struggle. The, the reality of what is called Palestinian civil society is shaped by settler colonial condition, which introduced peculiar characteristics to, the, to this civil society. Issues, for example, such as the absence of state, the territorial and geographical fragmentation of the society, the distortion of economic development, which impacted on Palestinian uh, class formation and